Alleluia, the Lord is risen. In the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. This is the good stuff. Pack church on Easter Sunday. This is wonderful. Happy Easter. I'm thrilled that you're here. If you're a regular here, this is great. If you're a guest, welcome home, and uh, we're thrilled that you're here. We haven't been saying hallelujah for a few weeks now, and we finally get to thank you, choir, for your ministry to us. Just sitting back there with the, the song they started out with just, you know, just messed us all up back there. It's spectacular. Thank you for your ministry. But hallelujah means praise the Lord. That's the whole point. Praise the Lord. And we respond with hallelujah, praise the Lord, because of the good news in Christ, that God intervened to rescue and deliver us. Jesus Christ is the center of God's plan for history. Jesus Christ is the basis for hope in the face of darkness, despair, and ultimately death. God's saving work has been accomplished solely through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, not earned by us in our effort, but received as a gift from God to us. From Genesis to Revelation, the gospel is God's promise of a son who would die in our place, in the place of sinners, and who would crush the head of the serpent. Also, we could enjoy the benefits of the forgiveness of sins, the profound assurance of our being reconciled with God. Adoption into the family of God, like we, we've always been there and belong there, and the promise of everlasting life. But let's be honest, in the face of reality, that seems too good to be true. It seems like a nice, well-meaning sentiment, but maybe not terribly helpful in the face of reality because we know all too well that life is filled with suffering. You came to church with it. I did too. Some of you are paralyzed by guilt because of the condemnation that you feel because of sins that you've committed. Some of us are overwhelmed with shame because of the sins committed against us. Some feel despair because of the impulse and addiction that has way more power over us than we over it. Some of us are shrouded in the darkness of depression. We can't just make it go away. And some of us are suffocated by grief because of death taking a loved one. And the promise of the gospel is by no means sentimental or a self-righteous view of life. In fact, the Bible has a very dark vision of reality. It tells us that Satan and his demons are at work in the world, wreaking havoc, hating God's people, hating images of God, and that we're so flawed and cruel to one another that we can't save ourselves unless God intervenes. Let me give you some of the sentences that we've been praying throughout Lent from our colleagues every week. Help us who are assaulted by many temptations. Be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways. We have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls so we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. You alone can bring in order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. How, how we pray those prayers and end up self-righteous is mind-blowing. Um, but I'm pretty good at it, and maybe you're like me, chief of sinners. But our confidence that we learn through Lent is not in ourselves, but in Christ. Our only hope is that Jesus has risen from the dead. He didn't come to teach the teachable, to improve the improvable, or to reform the reformable. He came to bring life in the face of death, because none of those other things work for the long haul. In the face of darkness, 
despair, and death. We need resurrection, not sentiment. A few years ago, a British artist named Damien Hirst unveiled his masterpiece. It was a diamond-encrusted, platinum-cast human skull priced at $98 million, and the skull was coated in 8,601 diamonds, with one big pink diamond being in the center of the forehead that was worth more than $8 million. The title of this piece of work was called For the Love of God, and it came from his mother who asked her son, for the love of God, Damien, what are you going to do next? His explanation of what he did and why he did it is fascinating. He said, my hope is that this work gives other people hope, that it uplifts their souls, takes their breath away, because it shows we're not going to live forever but it also has a feeling of victory over death. That's heartbreaking. That's how many people deal with darkness, despair, and death, because that's the best they've been given. In the face of the destruction of sin, you don't need a feeling of victory over death. You need real, tangible victory over death. You need real hope. In 1988, a famous secular humanist and novelist, Marganita Pulaski, was doing a television interview. And she did this interview a month before she died. She was just diagnosed with a terminal illness. And she, in this moment of of surprising candor, she turns to the camera and said, what I envy most about you Christians is your forgiveness. I have nobody to forgive me, care for me, or welcome me home when I die. Christians, I mean, this is, this is why we celebrate Jesus Christ, the one who stepped out of the grave on Easter morning, has the last word on you. Death has been swallowed up in Christ's victory. That's why 1 Corinthians 15 is a mockery of death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The resurrection of Jesus is a guarantee that your sins are forgiven, that God cares about you, and that he welcomes you home when you die because he conquered death, and he did that so evil is not the end of your story. Darkness, death, and evil is a part of all of our stories, but it's not the final word. Christ says that the final words on you, if you trust in him, are hope, healing, and life. And because of his resurrection, all threats against us are tamed. He conquered Satan, sin, hell, and the grave. And so, that's great news. What does that mean for us? What does it mean today for us? And I think it means two things. It means something right now, and it means something for the future. So, for right now, what it means is that rather than minimizing grief, darkness, despair, or death, he doesn't minimize those at all. We don't need that minimized. What we need is Jesus Christ. God himself experiences it and comforts us in it right now. The loss that causes grief is very real. It's not an illusion, but it's temporary. The knowledge that softens the blow of grief is not an abstract platitude or a sentiment, but it's the real empty tomb from 2,000 years ago. That's our assurance And so where darkness, despair, and death had reigned, Satan had his grip on the world, and Jesus shows up and peels off the fingers of Satan and says, mine. So where that was happening, Jesus breaks in, peels back the finger of Satan off the world, and claims it as his to bring love and forgiveness and healing. 
A picture of this comes from Robert Louis Stevenson, the author of Treasure Island. And he lived in Scotland in the 19th century. And as a boy, he lived on the hillside overlooking a small town down in the valley. And he was intrigued one evening by this lamplighter who was going from lamp to lamp with a ladder and a torch lighting each lamp. And as he was staring out the window watching with fascination, his parents wanting him, and he's 10 or 11, wanting him to come to dinner because food's on the table and they're ready to eat, said, Robert, what in the world are you looking at? And with great excitement, And you could tell he had a way with words as a 10-year-old. He said, Mom, Dad, look at that man. He's punching holes in the darkness. That's Easter. The light of the world came into the darkness of the world and the darkness you experience for the purpose of punching huge, gaping holes of light into darkness. The darkness is still dark. You have every reason to still be afraid and grieve and mourn, but the resurrection is God punching holes in the darkness and whatever darkness they are for you right now. This isn't only a future hope. This is a right now hope. It's mixed with darkness and light, but he is happily punching holes in darkness for you and for me. Second, When it comes to our fears and despair, we don't need the resurrection only to soften the blows. That's great, okay? I'm not minimizing the softening of the blows now, but we need way more than just a softening of the blow or readjusting of our horizon because that's too weak. We need our future transformed. And because the resurrection happened, everything is going to be way more than just fine. It's astounding the implications of the resurrection. J.R.R. Tolkien, another famous author who you know, wrote an essay called On Fairy Stories, in which he says that deep down inside, all humans find fairy tales and science fiction fascinating and compelling because what they experience there are five things. People escaping death. Think of your favorite science fiction, favorite kind of fairy tale story. People escaping death. People escaping time. Good triumphing over evil. Love that will, you will never lose. And communicating with non-human beings like trees or animals. And there's a part of us that says, yeah, that's great, that's fiction, but that doesn't really happen in real life. But there's a sense in all of us that deep, deep down that this is actually the way it's supposed to be. Tolkien argued that if the resurrection story is true and actually happened, and it's not just another fairy tale, then all of those things eventually will become true for you. C.S. Lewis called that the true myth. If Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then there is hard proof that all these things will come true again. If you trust in Christ, you will escape death. You will have a love that you can never lose. You will see good triumph over evil. You will talk to supernatural beings, God and his angels, and you will live forever. And why? What have we done to enjoy that? We get it because Jesus was killed. We get reconciliation with God because Christ was forsaken. We triumph over evil because we're in him And he, our Savior, was unjustly tortured, murdered, and defeated. Because of Christ, we learn that the happily ever after endings we long for aren't just fairy tales. This is what Tolkien said 
specifically about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel contains a fairy story, actually a story of a larger kind that embraces all the essence of fairy stories. But this story has entered history. This story begins and ends in joy and has the inner consistency of reality. There is no tale ever told that people would rather find true and none which many skeptics have accepted as true on its own merits. To reject it leads to sadness or to wrath. This is an all or not. To reject it leads to sadness or to wrath. And this is because we will be marked by one of three things forever. You will either be marked by wrath because of what you've done. You feel God's guilt and you feel condemnation because of that. And if not wrath, then you'll be marked by sadness because of what's been done to you. And you'll feel shame and defilement. Or you'll be marked by God's love, forgiveness, hope, healing, and security. You'll be marked as your sins being forgiven, God caring for you and welcoming you home because of what Christ did in his life, death, and resurrection for you. The most important thing I can say on Easter are actually words from Jesus. In John 10, he said, The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came that you will have life and have that life abundantly. And so with all this reality that we're experiencing and talking about, it's true, and we all know this, that in the midst of life, we're in death. It's all around us. We start declining when you're 18, apparently, so says science. But what's more than that, because of the resurrection, is that in the midst of death, we're actually in life. So live. He's given you the gift of life now and forevermore. You can live in abundantly. Jesus also says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's a few people here in the room. Some here, some of you just need a reminder. to Go to Jesus and rest. Believe what he said on the cross. It is finished. Believe what Peter said. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So the resurrection is guarantee that God is good, that he loves you, that you can trust him with every sin, care, pain, grief, detail in your life. Others might be here who are thinking the idea of the resurrection sounds unbelievable, that it's impossible to come back from the dead, and that death really is the last word. And so to you, I just echo Tolkien and say, deep down, maybe you wish it were true. And there are actually very good reasons to believe it is true, but this isn't an apologetic sermon. This is proclamation of what he's done. Faith is not certainty, but a gift from God and a living trust in God's grace and favor. Faith doesn't mean lack of doubt. Khalil Gibran puts it beautifully, doubt is a pain too lonely to know that faith is his twin brother. So faith is not the opposite of doubt. Rather, faith is what holds on to us in the midst of our doubts. And so, if that's you, there's a wonderful prayer that was prayed in the Bible that Jesus loved when he heard it. And it was this, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So, maybe that's your prayer. And then, that brings us to those who are here who are ready to turn to Christ for the first time or again. 
you know, wondering, how do you come to Jesus? What action is required? Simply trust that God has freely granted forgiveness of sins. Eternal righteousness and salvation. Simply ask him to give you the rest from your efforts to justify your own existence. Accept that you are accepted and enjoy the guarantee of your future because of his glorious resurrection. So one last time before we turn to the rest of the service, alleluia, the Lord is risen. Amen.